Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, RICE Learning Machine Seminars. Uh, RICE is uh, Sweden's research institute with uh, over 3,000 people working on a wide array of topics. Uh, the computer science department works on applied AI projects for the benefit of society, and we organize uh, these weekly learning machine seminars. The meeting will be recorded, and if you would like to be uh, removed for some reason, please let us know. Uh, also, make sure to check out our uh, collection of great talks that we have on our YouTube channel. And today, I have the pressure to pleasure to introduce uh, Mikolai Cherkowski. Uh, I hope I pronounced your last name okay. Uh, and uh, who is a post postdoctoral uh, research, uh, a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the European Space Agency in uh, Frascati in Italy. Uh, Mikolai is interested uh, broadly in data-centric analysis of large-scale Earth observation data, data set curation, generative modeling, as well as restoration tasks within satellite imagery. Uh, he is also the co-founder of uh, a recently released uh, project and data set called Major Tom. Major Tom is a community project which provides a platform for collaborating and reusing Earth observation datasets designed specifically for AI pipelines. Today's topic and title is uh, Geographical Guidance in the Era of Large-Scale Earth Observation Data and AI. And with that, uh, I leave the word to you, Mikolai. Welcome. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, my name is Miko, and I'm going to just start sharing my slides right now. Um, so just bear with me while I do that. Um, okay, uh, you can see the slides. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Um, again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for the time uh, taken today. Uh, my talk is on a geographical guidance in the era of large scale EO data and AI. And I use the term geographical guidance um, specifically because it overlaps nicely with a uh, fairly uh, famous, famous historical work of Ptolemy, uh, who uh, originally called his uh, work on geography uh, specifically that geographical guidance. Um, and with this theme, I am going to cover several ongoing projects at the uh, ESA PLAB that we've uh, completed in the past couple of months, including the uh, Major Tom initiative. Uh, but just to give some perspective and just to reflect on the process of interacting with Earth observation data, I am actually going to start with a quick overview of the, the old way, which really, really resembles the, the new way and our current challenges that we're still facing in the field of uh, observation. And then I'll provide um, the overview of the uh, ongoing projects. So with that, I think uh, I will start. So there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting uh, um, reflection to be made about Ptolemy's work. I mean, uh, geography is known to be one of the kind of great breaking, uh, groundbreaking um, efforts to begin world cartography. So before that work, uh, most of the cartography was actually limited to fairly narrow regions of uh, Earth. And world cartography at the time was a very new idea and a fairly innovative one to actually start thinking of a completely different um, domain, which would cover ideally the, the entire Earth uh, and the entire uh, known region of Earth, which was much smaller than the Earth itself. Uh, and the point I will be making is that, I mean, um, we're pretty much still in the, uh, depending on interpretation, we're still pretty much covering this gap between regional cartography and old cartography, because right now uh, the word cart cartography is much more than the knowledge of uh, the approximate shape of Earth. We're still trying to estimate what's going on Earth uh, continuously, uh, across the arrow of time. Um, and we're still pretty much uh, dealing with uh, uh, balance between the known and unknown and the way we kind of handle the data 
and the way we record and redistribute and um, share observation data. Um, so just a quick overview of what Ptolemy has actually done uh, in his geography work. Um, what's made it really special is that no, no world map from that period actually uh, remains until this day, as far as uh, as far as uh, we're aware. Uh, but what actually managed to persist through all this time is a set of rules for building world maps, and that's that's the most interesting part of uh, that work is that it's uh, enabled it to actually last through time through so many centuries. And for many centuries, it was actually a fairly unknown work, uh, at least in Central Europe, uh, until it was rediscovered um, in Italy uh, at, uh, a few centuries after, after this appearance. So the first part of the process was to estimate the size of the Earth, um, followed by uh, setting up a reference system. And back then, there was no reference system for uh, the Earth. Uh, because, again, almost all of the cartography was constrained uh, to fairly limited regions of space. So finding global coordinates and navigating across the entire globe was not really necessary. But there already existed a reference system uh, that could be applied to the Earth because um, stars and any objects that were visible on the, on the sky were actually associated with Coordinates. So this entire system was already in use. The North Pole, the South Pole, parallels, equator, meridians, they were already uh, established for navigating the sky. But it was this idea of bringing this back to, bringing this actually to Earth and applying it uh, for understanding of observation data at scale. Um, and uh, these, uh, all these concepts were actually really useful for establishing the first, uh, really the first global reference system. Um, then once that was defined, uh, uh, it was possible to start thinking of how different uh, points on earth could be maybe mapped and represented in that system. And um, that was easy enough for latitudes. It was uh, commonly known that by, at least in the Northern hemisphere, and that was all that mattered at the time, you could actually approximate your latitude by measuring the angle uh, of the elevation angle of the uh, North Pole star. So that was easy enough. The trickier part was longitude, and there was actually quite a lot of error, uh, uh, quite a lot of error associated with longitude in in those earlier maps, and until and uh, for many many years after as well. Um, and then there was a definition of the non-domain, which was basically all the all the geographical region and actually more uh, all the geographical re uh, regions that were um, observed by uh, uh, by the scholars associated with that part of uh, of the world um it was actually more than that there was quite a lot of geographical reasons that made it to the map that didn't really exist because people would uh, be very keen on making stuff up or just uh, combining or misrepresenting uh, various um, pieces of information, right? And then it was about establishing also the prime meridian, uh, meridian, uh, the east, uh, the east, uh, sorry, the east uh, limit of the known world, the northern limit and the southern limit. Um, and after that, uh, sorry, I got slightly, Ahead of myself with the uh, bringing with the bringing of uh, places onto the reference system, there was also the step of um, project uh, the step of projecting uh, the globe uh, onto a plane, which was also not really an issue before uh, before the time of making world maps instead of regional maps. And uh, there were three projections that were considered at the time, and that was another important part of the puzzle. Uh, uh, regarding how we actually represent um, the world on a flat surface. And then there was the data set. And actually, it was a fairly impressive data set of about seven or 8,000 geographical coordinates associated with various uh, points in place, uh, in space. Uh, some of them, again, were factual, and some of them were actually uh, um, 
imaginary or non-existent. Um, so that's about it. But my main point here is that um, the, the process is very much similar today. And what makes uh, this process effective is if we establish a clear set of rules uh, for how uh, a certain type of map or a certain type of data set can be produced. Um, and if we make these rules kind of reproducible and easy to repeat. And that's what really made Ptolemy, Ptolemy that we know today. Otherwise, we wouldn't really be aware of all the work that has uh, been done in the past. Uh, there was also the acknowledgement of noisy data. Uh, so uh, it, there was uh, the acknowledgement that uh, some parts of the world were inaccessible. There were false descriptions. Um, there were features that uh, ceased to exist. So the, another context is the important context is that there was this awareness that uh, making a world map was a task that would uh, result in uh, various kinds of misrepresentations. Um, but setting up this kind of uh, set of rules for the future, uh, the future map makers was really the kind of uh, key effective uh, act that, that was associated with Ptolemy's work. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the first uh, project that uh, I wanted to uh, go through here. Um, and that's Major Tom. Uh, it's one of our more recent projects and it is very much focused on, sim on the similar topics, albeit we are uh, mostly interested in building large data sets of Earth observation data from captured from satellites or mostly from satellites at least. Um, okay, so uh, TOM is uh, an acronym for uh, terrestrial observation metal set. And the idea here is somewhat similar. Um, the idea here is that we somehow want to coordinate between all of the people, all of the people in academia or industry building new Earth observation data sets. We want to coordinate how we put these data sets together. And if possible, it would be quite beneficial to have uh, a certain degree of compatibility of, uh, between, between these data sets um, and another key uh, motivation here is uh, the context of applying these data sets in uh, um, AI or deep learning uh, pipelines, because I would say that's another very uh, unique context that um, has to be reflected in how we put uh, and manage these data sets. Uh, and it's slightly different from maybe what the, where the, uh, what were the usual expectations in the geospatial community before the rise of deep learning? Um, okay, so uh, again, something we wanted to avoid is bending another standard where we ask people to follow that standard or <laughs> break it. Um, instead, we tried to find uh, a set of guidelines that would maybe guide people to, um, if possible, building data sets that can later uh, nicely uh, be combined and uh, in sort of like emergent uh, mixtures of different data sets that, um, that weren't necessarily uh, designed uh, uh, directly. Um, so reusability, overlap of samples in different expansions, easy mixing of compatible data sets were the kind of uh, guiding principles for this project. And the first use case for this set of rules that we defined, and there's not many rules, but there's uh, it's, it's more about the approach on how we define samples and how we kind of uh, deliver them and how we make them easily accessible. In any case, the first use case for that was the core data set. So we uh, decided that we could somehow test out this approach by building um, a very large scale data set of Sentinel to data uh, to which we have quite good access to um, at the European Space Agency. And also it's a satellite that is quite commonly used for a multitude of uh, tasks, very often involving um, uh, AI uh, techniques as well. Um, so we had to decide uh, what to uh, kind of, uh, how we want to think about this first data set. Um, and 
uh, we finally uh, arrived at a decision to basically provide a relatively agnostic sample of the entire archive. And what that means is we didn't want to focus on a specific month or on a time series. What we tried to do is cover the entire globe, cover every place on Earth that we practically can from the archive, um, and basically sample these um, various um, regions um, across the entire archive. So the temporal coverage is across the entire archive, but you can't really, uh, well, any sample could be from any random point in time that's covered by the archive. Um, and the main rationale for that was that uh, in a lot of self-supervised learning uh, projects or generative uh, modeling projects, uh, we often lack this kind of quick access to a fairly agnostic sample of Sentinel-2. And it immediately seemed like a very useful uh, source to tap into. And to be honest, for some of the projects I've done in the past, I was actually hoping there would be a data set like that that I could actually try out on uh, an experiment on. Um, the second use case was a pairing. So we mentioned, I mentioned earlier that um, it would be quite useful for data sets to kind of click into each other and make them easy uh, to combine. Um, and a very, uh, I would say, obvious uh, source uh, to combine Sentinel-2 with would be Sentinel-1 so that we have uh, better uh, better understanding of uh, of the environment. We are also obviously get the information uh, that it doesn't make it through the clouds and Sentinel-2. So it's a fairly common mix to use uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, and what we try to do is basically create an expansion data sets for this first Sentinel-2 data set that would allow an easy mixture of these two sources. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the first thing we um, wanted to achieve is um, basically, I mean, many, many previous um, data sets containing Sentinel-2 data would just contain a, a large bag of Sentinel-2 chips. And sometimes you would be able to retrieve the geometry and where these chips come from, sometimes not necessarily. Um, but in any case, there wasn't a nice, really an, a nice uh, kind of uh, organized uh, way of tessellating uh, a data set containing Sentinel-2. So what we wanted to do is just have these small chips that are kind of arranged in a fairly, uh, fairly consistent grid across the globe um, and something that can fairly readily be uh, used for, uh, again, for deep learning uh, pipelines, okay? Um, so instead of relying on the original large product uh, products uh, in Sentinel-2 that are usually about 100 kilometers in size, we decided to go up to uh, the size of about 1,000 pixels. In, in this case, that's about 10 kilometers and 10 meter resolution of Sentinel-2. Um, so in order to kind of find a way to organize all these samples on a grid. We estimated the radius of Earth, which is quite similar to the uh, Earth size estimation that had to be done for the original geography work. Uh, we divided, uh, so now from the equator, we would divide, uh, we would divide uh, the globe into 10 kilometer rows up to the poles. Um, and then for every row, and so it's not really a grid, that's why it's a pseudo grid. For every row, we would basically uh, draw, uh, divide uh, into 10 kilometer cells. Okay. So, like, uh, that's why that it's, it's a bit dangerous to think of these as columns because we will actually have a variable number of cells in each row. Uh, but that allowed us, allowed us to basically organize globe uh, into a very easy to work with grid. And that kind of forms the basis of this specific uh, major tone uh, version because the same kind of approach and we specify, we give like details on how to do that. The same approach could easily be applied for different kind of grid sizes uh, and depending on the application or the, on the kind of spatial 
uh, context of a given uh, of a given uh, data set, we might think of slightly different kind of uh, major tom uh, regimes. But for Sentinel one and Sentinel two, this seemed quite uh, quite effective. Okay, um, so basically we have this um, we have this pseudo grid of ten kilometer cells, and the process to generate Sentinel core uh, Sentinel two core was as follows: we would query available products over a given grid cell. So we would go over um, every single grid cell covered by uh, the Sentinel two sensor. Um, and we would uh, select a random four month period. Um, and sometimes four months wouldn't be enough to find a good sample. So it's quite interesting how cloudy some of the regions of the world are. Where even during four months, we would actually have to do uh, repeated attempts to actually find a good sample because okay, that's something I haven't mentioned. Uh, what we wanted to do is mostly observe cloud-free samples. So some cloud coverage would be allowed, but we mostly want to for now learn about uh, as much as we can about the surface of the earth rather than the atmospheric effects. Um, so we would order the, the samples from the four months uh, by the pre-computed cloud coverage, <clears throat> which is kind of provided with the Sentinel-2 data. It's not very accurate in many cases, uh, but it would serve us as a first kind of way of prioritizing certain samples over over the others. Um, and then what we've done is we would uh, actually download the first. We will start from the least cloudy one that we that uh, that uh, was deemed as least cloudy by the previous algorithm. We would download the product and we'd actually recheck again with Sensei version two, which is uh, a cloud masking algorithm recently published by my co-author. Uh, Alistair Francis. So that's that's his own work, but it's a cloud masking algorithm that seemed to work uh, better than anything else we've tried before. Um, so that's what we've used to kind of confirm whether we actually are be below 25% of cloud coverage. Uh, and then if none of these scenes were actually less than 25%, uh, were below 25% cloud coverage, we would actually uh, try uh, to increase that to 50%, okay? Um, then we would, ex hopefully, if uh, if, the, if everything went well and there was a um, sample with uh, that isn't obscured by clouds uh, too much, uh, we would extract the uh, 1068 pixel chip. So it would add some margin because we have all these rotations that, uh, so we basically wanted to ensure that um, it fills uh, most of the grid cell uh, as, as completely as, as, as we can. Um, and also we wanted, an, uh, in case anyone's wondering why it's 68, we wanted something that divides nicely into uh, lower resolution bands like the 60 meter band. So that's why it's 68 at the end. Um, I just mentioned Sensei, so I'm gonna mention it again. It's not my work, it's done exclusively by Alistair, but if you're interested, you can scan the code and it's uh, basically a cloud masking tool um, that has been trained on a number of sensors. So you can actually apply the same tool for Landsat, Sentinel, uh, and potentially other similar sensors. And it seems to work quite well as uh, we found out during uh, throughout this project. Um, okay, so once we've done this for all the cells that were covered by, in our grid that were covered by Sentinel-2, that's basically the coverage map. I don't know if it's visible enough through Zoom, like the small dots here and there, like some of the regions um, are a bit trickier to cover. Uh, you can see that most of the land is covered. You have some small black dots, and a black dot indicates a missing, a missing grid cell. If uh, we didn't manage to find that due to the cloud coverage, we, if we didn't find uh, an appropriate sample, we would sometimes just keep it due to the scale of this experiment. Because in total, we got uh, more than 50% of the entire Earth covered, uh, including the, you know, the effect that Sentinel-2 doesn't acquire, acquire the entire Earth. All the samples that we managed to acquire here actually cover 50% of the Earth. And that's in total at 2.5 trillion pixels 
uh, with 46 terabytes of data spread across both levels. So we uh, provide both level one and level two uh, data. And in total, that's 2.25 million of images at this uh, fairly high resolution of 1068. Uh, and at the time, I think it still is the largest ever kind of AI-oriented Sentinel-2 data set uh, that's available for immediate use uh, online. Uh, but when you consider the scale, it starts to uh, you start to notice how difficult some like it is to actually cover the entire globe. We, I mean, at least before actually embarking on this project, I had a feeling that it's easy enough, like Sentinel-2 is just capturing the entire Earth. It should be easy enough to, uh, to eventually build a complete representation that contains minimal cloud coverage. And obviously, there's a lot of work on that as well. But when you do it from scratch, it's uh, actually a fairly laborious, uh, laborious process with many different kind of uh, exceptions that you have to treat. Uh, and it's uh, it's it's a lot of work to to build these data sets, and that's why we also thought it would be nice if we made all these efforts sort of aligned to some degree at least. Um, so um, okay, as I've marked a point here. It's it's really like a, um, I'm going to show a QR code later for the browsing app in case you haven't uh, yet used it. But it's it's really fun to observe the samples that we get because most of them are quite high quality. Uh, with minimal cloud coverage, and you can see something that the AI model will see during training. You can actually see how uh, how much okay. different information content we actually get once we start sampling all the um, undersampled uh, regions of the Earth that often wouldn't make it to the deep learning data set. So that's one example from the far north. Um, and then I'm gonna I'm going to proceed to the expansion of Sentinel One. And you can see the coverage is much worse uh, for several reasons, but we still managed to uh, we still managed to uh, pair a large amount of Sentinel two images with a near, nearby Sentinel one image. And also, like when you start building a Sentinel one dataset, for instance, you start to see like how uh, kind of dynamic this ecosystem that we have is. Like some part of the world, some parts of the world might uh, start be sampled less frequently than others. Some might actually stop being some. Might at some point there's a, there are sometimes decisions to stop sampling certain parts of the world. So you get some interesting effects as well. Uh, but you start to realize again that with these big emissions, I mean, there's there's an uh, amazing amount of data that we get there, but there's also a lot of kind of. Uh, a lot of kind of uh, dynamic aspect to the way we, we map with these uh, missions. Okay, so uh, the example I've just uh, shown uh, a minute ago is uh, paired with a Sentinel-1 sample, and we basically provide this product again for a very large number of samples. We I think we have about 16 terabytes of Sentinel-1 data paired with 23 terabytes of uh, Sentinel-2 data. I'm sorry, I'm uh, using the numbers of uh, the file size, but uh, that's that's the one number that I now remember. In any case, uh, we have a very large uh, uh, data set of unprecedented scale of pairs of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. Um, but I mentioned this, we, we did kind of design this as a community effort. So eff effectively, everything is centered around an organization we set up. It's not a formal organization, it's just a way to uh, provide people to contribute to the project if they want to. And we are in touch with several um, several researchers and uh, several uh, kind of parties that are interested in building potential expansion data sets that would benefit their work. So this is, uh, if you're interested in building expansions to Major Tom or uh, benefiting maybe from future expansions, this is a place where you can kind of find all the information and also share your work if you have any uh, any any contributions that uh, you would like to uh, put up. Um, so <clears throat> that's another part of the kind of puzzle. So like just downloading these uh, 50 terabytes of Sentinel-2 data, for instance, was uh, sort of uh, just half of the work, I would say. Uh, because there's still, I would say, uh, fairly unexplored territory on how we distribute like AI-ready data sets 
uh, for F observation. So obviously, again, this is a fairly established field because we've been uh, building um, archives for all the missions for a number, a number of years. But the context of providing easy access of AI-ready samples is often uh, missing to some degree, at least. Um, and I would say there's still a lot of work to be done on this front. Uh, we chose Hugging Face because it's widely known, it's free, and uh, you can host up to 50 terabytes of open data there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we also decided to, uh, but there are certain limitations uh, on Hugging Face. So uh, you cannot go over 100,000 files, at least uh, at the time of making this data set. I think that's still true. And we had uh, 2.25 million samples with 13 bands in each sample. Um, so that was way over the limit and we had to somehow combine these samples. And what we wanted to avoid is just packing them into large archive files that would have to be downloaded because the idea here is most people will not need the entire uh, data set. Uh, only in some circumstances will, uh, will there be uh, an actual will to uh, in just the entire data set. I mean, that would be absolutely amazing, but it would be a far minority of the cases where people have uh, the resources to actually train on a complete uh, major Tom core data set. Um, so this capability of factorizing, um, factorizing major Tom and building your own kind of subset of an existing data set was really important for us. So, um, and again, um, the hugging face has certain constraints and the parquet file format is something they were uh, recommending to us a lot. And they have a lot of infrastructure in place that kind of supports this file format. And it's a sort of a tabular format where you can extract different pieces of, uh, uh, of the file. You can extract specific columns and specific rows, which worked quite well for us. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to kind of preserve all the information that is uh, present in a GeoTIFF. So what we've actually done is we uh, encoded uh, basically a byte stream for the geo from the individual GeoTIFF uh, files into columns of the parquet, and that seems to have worked quite well. Um, and that's basically the entire kind of uh, the entire system for distributing the data at this point. Obviously. If we could only have uh, a place to store this data openly with the right infrastructure to provide, uh, provide it potentially at high bandwidth, uh, we could just store the, all, the, all the files in their original uh, format. And maybe that's something that we will start to see more in the future. Uh, but given kind of this, uh, this, this was a fairly early project and, and the first time we've uh, built something of this kind, we decided to uh, go with this specific solution. I mentioned earlier a uh, web app where you can uh, try out uh, the samples from the data set. And again, it's it's, the, it's up there um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a really nice way to kind of understand the coverage and understand uh, how different samples look in our data set. And, I mean, if you see a model trained on this data set, uh, you can actually check what image, uh, whether it has actually observed a given uh, part of the globe and uh, what sample it was that it observed. Um, so um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to speed up a little bit, uh, but there's a lot of um, kind of software support that we've released as well along the major Tom. So the idea of filtering data as I mentioned earlier on, like get, it's uh, it's quite straightforward to download a metadata file from uh, Major Tom, specify the requirements, and basically filter it out and quickly basic. Did it freeze for someone else? Yes. Right, so, like, sorry, Nikolai, it was frozen for maybe twenty or thirty yeah. seconds there. So, but now uh, it's. I don't okay. know. Yeah, no, I don't this know was stop. That, that, that was fine. So keep going. Okay. I think somewhere here where, where it was it was frozen. Okay. Uh, 
I was just saying that you can uh, either download uh, a local copy of the subset or you can feed the samples directly uh, uh, from Hugging Face. You can also, uh, if you have uh, a set of geographical coordinates, you can very easily reuse some of our code to basically get matching satellite acquisitions associated with those geographical coordinates. So all of that is present there and I'm just going to speed up a little bit. Okay, uh, so now regarding the future of the Majorton project, uh, uh, we currently have a mix of internal and external adoption. So we're already using uh, the core data set uh, for several projects in the P-Lab. Um, but also we're, uh, I mean, even, uh, even again, inside the P-Lab, we are building expansions of the data set that kind of still operate on the same major Tom 10 kilometer grid. And uh, we have, uh, we're, uh, we are currently uh, have several collaborations in which uh, the same approach is used for other uh, kinds of, of observation data to potentially make them expansions as well that could be combined with our existing ecosystem. Um, so there was a lot of ideas that we've discussed with the community as well, and that we don't have right now uh, a lot of uh, activity going on uh, just yet, but the idea of reusing the same samples from a data set like Now it froze again. For, let's see if it unfreezes soon. Hello, Mikolai. Uh, so you, you were talking about the collaborative labeling. Uh, can you yeah. Uh, repeat yeah, that yeah. part? Thank you. Because it froze. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That, I can see there's some issues with the connection now, but uh, I hope it will be fine. And at least I'm, I'm, for the next couple of minutes. Um, anyway, <clears throat> um, so uh, that's another idea we've discussed quite a bit. We don't have uh, an activity going on there yet, just yet, but the idea of using something like uh, Major Tom Core to kind of uh, make people label similar samples, especially if there are tasks that where these samples are in fact relevant. I mean, there are a lot of unique tasks in EO when this doesn't really apply. But in many other cases, uh, when it does, it would allow to basically combine labels from different tasks and have uh, enables uh, several kinds of like multitask learning uh, or use uh, these labels could be used as uh, a metadata uh, for uh, in, in various contexts. So that would be really um, that would be another really. A promising uh, direction in the future, open benchmarking as well. So again, it depends on the task and then we would need label for for that. And obviously labels, even like uh, non-collaborative labels are currently being considered, although we don't have, we're not actively building a label data set uh, of in, in a major Tom expansion right now. But what this, that would again allow is that if we have benchmarks that <clears throat> operate on similar input samples, we would again uh, be able to kind of standardize the way we evaluate AI models. Um, and again, I mean, I've already shown that there's a there's an online demo to browser samples and it's being hosted on Hugging Face and Hugging Face is offering uh, basically a nice platform for de demoing various AI models. So that means that the same app can effectively be transformed into an app that demonstrates the capability of a model that operates on the same kind of data. Uh, so I think that's another thing that's kind of missing right now from the ecosystem. I mean, there's we see a bit more uh, demos being released in the last year or so, but we still have a lot of models that are just being released, but are not uh, entirely transparent. And it's not entirely, like, unless you are working with that specific um, on that specific topic and you are fairly uh, skilled in manipulating and uh, using um, the deep learning frameworks, it actually might not be immediately, uh, the performance of a given model might not be very easy to judge without that. Um, this, I've, like since the release, uh, which I think happened about two months ago, there were actually a few developments that we didn't manage to include in our paper. And that is actually a nice overview of the previous efforts on in this direction in our paper. So I will refer you to that. 
But there's also stuff that we didn't manage to cover just yet uh, because it happened quite recently. So there's the satellite data set, which is quite interesting. It contains 3 million locations at one meter resolution. So it's fairly sparse across the globe, but the scale is quite impressive and it could be very interesting for the high resolution, very high resolution use cases. There's the MM Earth data set, which is kind of similar to the idea that we've had as well. Uh, because some of the expansion we are we were foreseeing were uh, included uh, the modalities that they've released, um, like a digital elevation model and so on. So in this case, we have 1.2 million locations, but with 12 modalities, um, slight, slightly smaller chip size, but um, the number of modalities that have been uh, <clears throat> acquired for the data set, I think, uh, makes it quite interesting and a potential a uh, useful asset for uh, many uh, prototyping or non-prototyping use cases in deep learning. Um, and finally, Earth Genome, I think yesterday released their cloud-free uh, data set from 2023 across the globe that's hosted on source code. Um, and that covers a single year of Sentinel-2 data. So uh, in our case, we have Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, and we uh, actually are trying to build something that expand in the future. And here we have a very nice sample of 2023 with multiple uh, multiple acquisitions per location, as far as I understand it. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to start to wrap up, but so I'm just quickly going to cover this project. Uh, and it's a project about understanding uh, of observation data at scale. And it's a project about understanding it in a fairly unique context, which is the web. So um, that it's what's what's quite interesting. What really motivated this project is the fact that I mean, stable diffusion models, and we have a paper on on kind of the emergent out of the box uh, performance of st stable diffusion models for EO. They have some idea about what a, a satellite image should look like. So it's quite interesting to explore how the training data set of a model like stable diffusion has enabled that and what kind of representation this model actually had access to during training. And Stable Diffusion has been trained on Lion 5B dataset, which includes 5 billion of images uh, scraped from the web. Um, so um, some of these images might uh, actually be copyrighted. So the idea to, uh, for releasing Lion 5B uh, as an open dataset was to basically release the links to images from the scraped uh, version of uh, scraped data set of common crawl, which basically scrapes the entire internet uh, every, um, like continuously, I think for, for a number of years. Um, so the idea here was to basically check what, like in the 5 billion of images that we have uh, in Lion 5B, whether it is, um, whether the, the representation of Earth observation data set is like what kind of scale are we talking about and whether there's a, a fair amount of Earth observation images uh, in it and what are they like, right? So the big the big challenge here is uh, a starting point. So it's a bit difficult to, I mean, there's, uh, there's along with uh, Lion 5B, there were tools released where you can use clip embeddings to query with text and look for similar images that align with that text embedding. So this is roughly what we've done, but if you just say a satellite image or a satellite image of this or that, it doesn't feel very complete uh, in terms of like querying the entire domain of Earth observation. So in this case, what we've done is actually we've uh, used a CloudSend 1.2 uh, cloud-free subset, and that's a few thousand of cloud-free uh, <clears throat> images from um, across the world. Uh, back then, we didn't have major tom because I think that would be a fairly nice way of using, uh, of querying the, the 5 billion of images. But here, basically, we use only a few thousand. And we uh, computed the clip embeddings from this data set. And there's a, uh, there's a pre computed data set of clip embeddings of Lion 5B. So we basically looked for the most similar. Uh, images in Lion 5B to the images that we have in our so-called anchor data set um, from Clausen 1.2. Um, another important uh, aspect here is that we had to use, uh, uh, basically, uh, in order to make this uh, computationally uh, efficient, 
we used uh, Facebook uh, fast similarity uh, technique that was also used by the Lion 5B authors. But that, uh, as, but basically that introduces quite a bit of noise. It's a very fast method of uh, computing similarities for uh, very large de vector databases. Um, but there's a certain error that's being introduced. But what we can do is we can recompute the similarity after we identify the most likely nearest neighbors for each of the anchor samples. Um, another thing we can do after finding these nearest neighbors is we can com uh, compare them to the a satellite image text prompt. So we can still use text prompt, but after determining uh, the nearest neighbors based on vision. And that basically gives, uh, gives us uh, these two um, different dimensions. We have, uh, we can measure semantic similarity using text to a certain degree and image similarity which is basically the, the noise uh, similarity between anchor images and the image is in, in, uh, in Lion 5B. Okay, and based on that, we can, uh, we can filter and determine the most confident, the samples that we would be most confident about. So just to give you an example, uh, semantically dissimilar and visually dissimilar uh, sample would be basically an error of the fast similarity uh, algorithm, which sometimes would happen. So in this case, we have an anchor that basically contains a thing, maybe an image of a ship, um, and uh, the, the, the nearest neighbor result is not very good. Uh, but then we also have semantically similar, but visually dissimilar. So sometimes these errors that were made by the fast algorithm would still actually give us a uh, satellite image. And in that case, we can still keep it in the, in the data set. Uh, is everything, is the connection still fine? Because I, I just saw a notification that, okay. yeah. still, still going? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Um, and finally, we can have, we can, the semantic dissimilarity is uh, quite useful for when we actually find nearest neighbors that are visually similar. In this case, we have this kind of uh, histopathology a uh, sample that looks very much like one of the satellite images that we had in our ONCO data set. And finally, we have the sweet spot where we have both semantic and visual overlap. Um, so these are some examples from the data set. Maybe you can recognize uh, some of the uh, images that are uh, in the data set. And what makes it really interesting is that it's a completely new way of uh, sampling Earth observation data because it's effectively uh, a way of biasing towards things that matter to people that they want to share online. So it's a it's a very unique way of understanding um, what happens on the globe because it's uh, effectively limited to things that people will share online. Um, so in the end, we have released a data set. Oh, not really uh, the data set, but the links to the nearest neighbors that we found with 100, uh, sorry, uh, 112,000 uh, samples uh, when we use that 1,000 nearest neighbors, including all the filtering stages. And we have captions for each one of these images, which is another um, unique uh, feature of the data set is that we have human generated captions associated with each image, which are actually quite hard to get, and which is something that I think will be an area of uh, quite uh, intense research in the next couple of months or years where we hopefully will be finding better ways to annotate uh, annotate EO data with natural language captions. So I'm gonna move on to conclusion now because we're quite short in time, uh, but there's, there's no big message. There's only the, I would say, reflection on the process of interacting with EO data on uh, sharing it, on distributing it and uh, on processing it in a way that allows reuse, uh, fairly democratized access and uh, easy incorporation into deep learning pipelines. Um, so another, another conclusion is that the, the API pipelines uh, context is a fa is fairly unique, and the, basically the way we the way we distribute and the way we share um, EO data must kind of reflect in the coming years uh, the the ways in the, in, in which the EO data is, is being used. Uh, it's a trade off between restrictive standards and loose rules. So major tone, what we hoped would be is a set of fairly loose rules that still allows for building compatible data set. Um, 
And uh, abstract, okay, the next one is about the, the last project I covered, which is abstract semantic fil filtering of large scale EO data will play an increasingly important role. Again, this is something we've already seen in some of the recently published research, and we will be seeing that in a couple of months um, as well. There was actually uh, more on this topic that I wanted to share today, but we actually need a few more weeks in order to uh, make that fully public. So you can uh, follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn to stay up to date, but there will be, a, a, I think, um, a very exciting project that I will be happy to share very soon that uh, kind of uh, addresses the, um, the context of abstract semantic understanding of, uh, of our environment across, uh, across uh, at a large scale. Um, I think this is where I'm going to stop. So uh, if there are any questions, we can uh, proceed to that. And I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nikolai. Very interesting stuff today. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Let's uh, let's open the floor to, to questions. So uh, anyone, feel free to unmute and uh, throw your questions to Nikolai. And uh, I can maybe start while others are thinking mm -hmm. about some questions. So uh, I really like this idea of this sort of community aspect to the major Tom data set. And you did mention some future directions that you want to see uh, within within the data set and the project overall. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one, one thing that uh, I was wondering is, um, are you interested in collecting or sort of uh, combining other sorts of data with your massive uh, globally covering data set? Like, for example, there's uh, a lot of projects uh, collecting, for example, soundscape recordings uh, around the globe, for example, for, uh, you know, biodiversity monitoring. So uh, you could use geotagged mm -hmm. audio or something like that to, to associate or, or ground level imagery and, and stuff like that. So could you comment on that? Yeah, bit? definitely. I mean, that's, a very well, I would say a very wide and a very promising direction that we want to <clears throat> focus on in the coming months. And actually we have been focusing uh, in the last couple of months because apart from the motivation behind creating just a very large uh, sample of the Sentinel-2 archive, we also, sorry, we had another project where, um, where we were exploring the I think many people are doing that actually in many groups, but we've been exploring the, the usage of ground uh, level imagery to kind of uh, improve understanding of various satellite um, sensors. Um, so we have a data set that is actually ready uh, almost and will be released very soon. It's, it's, a different, uh, uh, it's a different data set to what I just described in the conclusion slide, but uh, it's a data set that effectively combines, um, actually not core, because, I, okay, another thing I wanted to mention is that the core data set is a fairly unique data set because we just randomly found a sample from each, uh, each place on the globe that we could find. Uh, but that will often not work for, uh, for modalities like soundscape or ground level imagery, because very often we want to minimize the, uh, the time difference between the acquisitions. So that actually requires people to contribute more also on this on the side of uh, of the satellite captures, uh, which means the whole thing has to be kind of redone again. And that's what we've done. So we have another data set created like Major Tom Core that combines um, ground level imagery with, with satellite data. And we're exploring also different modalities that can uh, kind of Act as a feed of uh, a feed of uh, context for understanding uh, modalities like Sentinel two or Sentinel one. All right, thank you very much. That sounds very interesting. Uh, so, any anyone else uh, with me? Otherwise, I'll see if I come up with something more as well. But I leave I leave it open a little bit now. I would have a question. Hi, Nico. Hey. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, or it sounded like the major Tom data set is now a collection of many years, like from 2015 until now, basically. Um, I guess that's- That's more or less true, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. 
sounds like a great resource for pre training. It's slightly conditioned. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, there's this uh, strange, there's this strange delay between us, so it takes oh. a while to react. But I'm gonna just finish right now, which is uh, my my main point was that um, there's a lot of sources of noise, I would say, because sometimes I mean even our internal archive would just have I don't know a few months missing from a given from a given region uh, because this or that. There's there's a lot of noise involved in the uh, engineering of 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 these archives. Um, so I would say there's a bit of noise of how it's covered, but essentially we can go as far back as, as the beginning of Sentinel-2 archive. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. But my question to this would be, let's say we have now a, a model developed for a specific application and we would like to deploy this at a global scale to produce maybe a global map. Um, mm -hmm. Then like the major Tom, data set would only allow us to compute basically a composite over several years. Are you planning yeah. to create like mm -hmm. major Tom versions that are more annual data sets, for instance, like a global mm -hmm. coverage for a specific year or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, so that's really interesting because it was one of the, uh, like it was again, one of the first ideas that we had as well. And we discussed like whether we kind of prioritize like a fairly uniform sample of various phenomena over the years, or whether we want to make something more similar maybe to a map where we actually have a consistent coverage across a limited uh, time scale. Um, so for inference, that's definitely very attractive, but obviously we prioritize this kind of random sampling for uh, just to, to, to improve the coverage. Um, in terms of like manpower, we currently have several other projects that kind of, uh, make it difficult to build like new samples of uh, major tom at this scale uh we would def like if we if we had the manpower we would definitely do like a monthly composite and that would be the most amazing thing that uh, that could be done with this project but um i'm hoping that, th that we find a way to kind of uh coordinate this and maybe at least create one data set that's i don't know maybe like a recent sample that allows people to apply models to at least a fairly updated representation of the environment, right? That would be really helpful, I guess, yeah. I think starting at an annual level is enough. It doesn't have to be monthly, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, but I think like a lot of people, I, I mentioned these few data sets, uh, including I think one that you were involved with, uh, but it seems like more people are happy to spend a bit more time in building large data sets. So even if it's not a major ton compatible, even if it's, uh, I think it's uh, it's becoming more likely that we see more more contributions like that from across the across the the whole community, even if it's outside of major Tom. So I'm really hopeful that whether it's uh, it's a continuation of this product or it's something completely different, uh, we will. That it will start to be more commonplace to see stuff like that, uh, and then we will be using that for uh, in, in in the exact way that you described. All right, thanks. Thanks for that question. And uh, if anybody else wants to chip in, but we still have some time left. So, yeah, I, I was wondering also, um, so the contributions to the this community project, do you see it mainly being about around different sorts of data as has been discussed so far in also in these questions here? Or are you also interested in like hosting some sort of uh, AI models like uh, foundation models trained on the major Tom pre-trained or something? Yeah, yeah, like we have uh, quite a few projects related to foundational models, um, even inside the P-Lab. Um, I would say that major Tom is mostly uh, focused on providing a data foundation. So even if it becomes useful for evaluating or demoing um, models, I think this is basically where we want to kind of draw the line of uh, what this should involve. It should be exclusively about 
just providing the nice ecosystem for building models, evaluating models, and interacting with models. Uh, that said, we are like some of the main use cases that I mentioned in the slide are foundation models or just really large models that we could consider foundational uh, that are being uh, uh, currently developed. So obviously, there's a big there's a there's a um, real, uh, relevant relevance for uh, for the for this context, and it's one of our main kind of links in terms of like trying to make an impact with with the, on the actual development side. Um, but uh, Major Tom is, is uh, as I said, is exclusively uh, focused on, on the data aspect. And I think uh, also because I feel like we're very far from uh, defining this kind of compatible and healthy ecosystem for sharing and building data sets. I don't know, like, I'm fairly confident that even Major Tom would need some changes, like, uh, after all the lessons we've learned during this first stage of the process, there's a lot of uh, maybe additional uh, context we could uh, use to improve this this whole uh, this whole proposal. Although I'm, uh, uh, the way it's working right now seems to work for for our internal use cases. Uh, but what I was going to say uh, is that I, I would treat in general this challenge of building a nice ecosystem far from being done. So there's still plenty of focus that needs to be. Uh, given to on the data side. Right, right. So yeah, I think um, maybe it's time to wrap up um, unless there's some 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 final question from someone in the audience. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mikolai, again for this very interesting talk. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope uh, thank you. many people will contribute to this interesting project. Um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, next week we have uh, another of these seminars. Uh, that time it will be Shruti Nath at the University of Oxford, uh, who will talk about machine, lear machine learning modeling for like climate and uh, uh, weather models. So hope to see many of you done. And thanks again. <laughs>